Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Chief Executive Officer of the Space Foundation, Mr. Elliot Pullum. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for being here with us tonight for the uh, opening of the 27th National Space Symposium. Uh, Ethan Bortnick is truly a wonderful young man. I had a chance to visit with him uh, a little bit earlier today. Uh, when he found out that he was coming out to perform at this event, uh, he and his uh, father made a, a trip to the Air and Space Museum at the Smithsonian so that he could see some of the things that have been done in the past, and he's, he's looking forward to coming and seeing uh, some of the exhibits that you have uh, here tonight. And uh, he will be back as soon as we've uh, taken care of a little bit more business with a few more phenomenal numbers for you. Um, the reason that we decided to select Ethan this year is because we have really tried to put an emphasis this year on, on a couple of things. And one of them is on education, which is the primary mission of the Space Foundation. And so we have a number of programs going on this week. Uh, we will have uh, about 2,500 students uh, come through the uh, symposium this week with structured programming. We have about 300 teachers that will be here with us this week uh, who also have structured programming. Uh, sitting in, uh, amongst you is our newest class of uh, teacher liaisons. We have, I believe, 93 new teacher liaisons from 19 different states. Uh, and they have come here this week to, uh, to improve their understanding of how to use space in the classroom and to come up, up to date with, uh, with what's going on in our world. Uh, we also have a number of programs uh, that we've put together for what we call our new generation leaders. And these are, these are the up and coming leaders of our industry uh, who are 35 years uh, young uh, or less. And they have had a chance to meet with senior mentors from our uh, industry and uh, they have special programming uh, that they will uh, participate in. And so we've got a, a, a very, very big emphasis on the education uh, component this year uh, because uh, these young people are the future of our industry and we want to make sure that our industry always gets the very, very best. It's been an interesting year uh, since the last symposium. Uh, the, uh, the space report was just released last week uh, by the, uh, the Space Foundation. And uh, on a global basis, the industry grew another 7.7%, uh, which brings it to about a nice round $280 billion or something like that industry. There have been some shifts in where things are happening. Uh, overall employment globally is stable. Uh, however, it's kind of down in the US and up in Japan and other countries. Uh, but overall, the industry is doing very, very well. There's, there are a lot of questions still to be solved about what the future is going to look like. We have some of the people who are, who are working on building the future with us here uh, this evening. I'm going to introduce one in a moment when we do some awards. And we have uh, the spacecraft of the future sitting over uh, in the Boeing showcase. Uh, and I hope you get over there tonight to see all those, uh, those wonderful things. We have with us uh, representatives of more than 20 different nations. Uh, we have uh, delegations from a number of countries. And the, the symposium becomes more and more international every year. I would like to, uh, to take a moment, though, to single out uh, one particular group of people. And that is our friends uh, from Japan. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Board of Directors of the Space Foundation, uh, I want to thank you all for making the trip. We were all very, very uh, alarmed and uh, saddened by the events that took place in Japan about a month ago. Uh, but yet we have been absolutely inspired by your response to those events. And so I thank you very much for being here with us tonight.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who have been coming to this event for years, and I, I know that there are several people in this room who are attending their 27th National Space Symposium, and I, I can't thank you enough for that. There are a number of things new this year. We always try and provide some new things. We've been very delighted uh, with uh, all the support that we've uh, received from our, our corporate partners. And uh, this year we have uh, four different exhibit areas for you to visit. We have the uh, Boeing Exhibit Center North, which is the big hall kind of behind us. We have the Boeing Exhibit Center South, which is out this way. Uh, below the Boeing Exhibit Center North, on the lower level, we have another area where we have a lot of education activities going on. We have the Aries Auditorium. We have company offices and exhibits at the lower level. So I encourage you to get down there and see that. And as I was mentioning, we have the Boeing Showcase out here in the Golden Bee parking lot where we have uh, actual spacecraft and mock-up of spacecraft uh, that you really need to go see. Um, also out in front of the summit, uh, Boeing has been uh, generous enough to bring a, a very special uh, spacecraft, uh, the uh, test article for the uh, X-37 uh, spacecraft, and so we'd like to encourage you to see that as well. Also, for those of you who want to take a quiet meeting, have a cup of coffee, but just can't bear to pull yourself away from the program, uh, over in the uh, main hall, uh, main uh, part of the Boeing, uh, of the, excuse me, of the Broadmoor Hotel in the Crystal Room, uh, we have set up a, uh, a special uh, uh, simulcast lounge where we will have the program live from in here on big screens, but you can sit and have a cup of coffee, visit with a friend, or take an informal meeting. So hopefully these changes uh, uh, and, and additions will enhance everyone's experience. Uh, the great thing about the Space uh, Symposium is all the people who come to make it special. As you can imagine, uh, last Friday, we were, uh, how do I say, pins and needles would probably not quite capture it for us, but uh, we, had, uh, we had surveyed our customers uh, several weeks ago, and every single one of them said the show goes on, and we were delighted that uh, the show went on in Washington. It was quite a show, and, and um, I think that Mr. P.J. O'Rourke is going to have a few things to tell us about that on Thursday night, so I hope you're all planning to join us for the Hall of Fame uh, dinner on Thursday night. All right, so with that, I would like to begin the awards part of the program by calling on my good friend, Dr. Stephen Feldman from the Astronauts Memorial Foundation to join me up here. Steve? Receiving the Alan Shepard Technology and Education Award is a tremendous honor for an educator. Consequently, we have received outstanding applications from every part of the United States. A distinguished panel of astronauts, executives, leaders in the space community, including Alan Shepard's daughter, Laura, who's here with us this evening, selected James E. Richmond from the Charles County Public Schools in Maryland to be the 2011 recipient of the Alan Shepard Technology and Education Award. Alan Shepard, one of America's original Mercury astronauts, was the first American to fly in space and was one of only 12 humans who have walked on the moon. He was also an early director of the Astronauts Memorial Foundation. In his memory, the Space Foundation, NASA, and the Astronauts Memorial Foundation partnered to create the Alan Shepard Technology and Education Award, which is presented annually to a K-12 educator. The Shepard Award recognizes excellence in the development and application of technology in the classroom or to the professional development of teachers. The 2011 recipient of the Alan Shepard Technology and Education Award is James Richmond, Superintendent of Charles County Public Schools in Maryland. The superintendent of a district with nearly 27,000 K-12 students 
Richmond has launched multiple programs to help his students excel in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, including Project Lead the Way, a high school aerospace engineering themed program. Gateway to Technology, which includes a new flight and space curriculum in Charles County Middle Schools. STEM curriculum, written by the NASA Dryden Flight Research Center. Space Foundation, Space Across the Curriculum, professional development courses for Charles County teachers of all grade levels. Telepresence Distance Learning Technology, for live exchanges among students and aerospace scientists and engineers around the world. Magic Planet special equipment that allows teachers to use real-time NASA data to create three-dimensional videos that depict scientific phenomena. The Team America Rocket Challenge, an international program to involve students in aerospace engineering and a $74 million space-themed high school now under construction. Thanks to his leadership, Charles County Public Schools has become an elite national leader in K through 12 academic achievement. Congratulations, James Richmond, 2011 Allen Shepard Award honoree. Thank you. I'm proud to accept the Alan Shepard Award on behalf of the students and teachers of the Charles County Public Schools. This award is for all those students who think they can't learn math and science and for the teachers who show them that it's possible. I want to thank the National or the Astronauts Memorial Foundation the National Aeronautics and Space Administration for recognizing the excellence in the Charles County Public Schools. I also want to thank the Space Foundation who's traveled along with us in this journey to excellence. The award recognizes the opportunities of Charles County provides for our students who this summer are placing science experiments and artwork on the final Atlantis flight. Accepting the award for this noble astronaut, Alan Shepard, on behalf of our students is both humbling and an honor. Thank you. To uh, present our next two awards, I'd like to call on the chairman of the board of the Space Foundation to join me on stage, Dr. Bill Ballhouse. The Space Achievement Award is an award that recognizes an out outstanding accomplishment either in space technology or the application of space technology. It recognizes teams, companies, individuals. It has been awarded uh, to, to incredible individuals like General Tom Warman. It has been awarded to uh, revolutionary and important and milestone projects like the International Space Station. And tonight, we're going to present it to two very different organizations, very, very deserving. One, a pioneer in space, and one, a pioneer in space applications. Would you please turn your attention to the video? The Space Achievement Award recognizes individuals or organizations that have demonstrated breakthrough space technology or program or product success, representing critical milestones in the evolution of the exploration, development, or utilization of space. Demonstrating the diverse ways in which space serves humanity, the 2011 Space Achievement Award is presented to two very different organizations, Space Exploration Technologies and Telecom Sans Frontières, in recognition of their extraordinary achievements. Space Exploration Technologies, or SpaceX, is recognized for becoming the first commercial company to launch, orbit, and successfully return a spacecraft from low Earth orbit. With its commercially developed Falcon family of rockets, 
SpaceX has a diverse manifest of over 40 launches to deliver commercial satellites to orbit. After the space shuttle retires, the Falcon 9 launch vehicle and Dragon spacecraft will carry cargo to and from the International Space Station for NASA. With an ultimate goal of providing a cost-effective commercial solution for human travel to and from low Earth orbit. On December 8, 2010, SpaceX's Dragon spacecraft was launched into low Earth orbit atop a Falcon 9 rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. It orbited the Earth at speeds greater than 17,000 miles per hour, re-entered the atmosphere, and landed in the Pacific Ocean that afternoon. Telecom Sans Frontières is recognized for its unique use of space to aid communications and save lives during natural disasters and emergencies. This humanitarian, non-governmental organization specializes in emergency telecommunications. TSF's primary tools are light, highly portable satellite terminals that are deployable within minutes, providing worldwide coverage. Since its creation in 1998, Telecom Sans Frontières has developed a reputation for being among the first to arrive on the scene after a disaster and has intervened in more than 60 countries, serving hundreds of thousands of victims and 600 organizations, most recently deploying to Japan in response to the massive earthquake and tsunami. At this time, I'd like to call to the uh, podium a gentleman who has been a tremendous supporter of the Space Foundation, has been a tremendous pioneer in our, inter in our industry, and has been kind enough to loan us his space capsule, which is on display in the Golden Bee parking lot. Please welcome the Chairman and Chief Technology Officer of SpaceX, Elon Musk. Good to see you again. Well, um, thank you very much. It's a great honor to receive this award. I accept it, of course, on behalf of the uh, almost 1,300 people of SpaceX uh, who've put in a, just a phenomenal amount of, of work to achieve what, what you saw on video there. Um, and uh, also recognizing, of course, we've got a, a significant responsibility um, coming with the retirement of the space shuttle and the dependence of this, the space station on, on our vehicle, uh, which we take uh, very seriously. Uh, but Thank you very much. It's a, it's a great honor. As you just saw, Telecom Sans Frontier is one of the first organizations on the scene in uh, epic national uh, disasters, natural disasters. Uh, and they have taken the application of space technology to humanitarian uh, uses uh, like no other organization that we have seen. Would you please welcome the U.S. Representative of Telecom Sans Frontières, Mr. Paul Margie. Congratulations. too eager. Uh, 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 thank you very much for this award. On behalf of uh, all the folks in Telecom Software around the world, we have teams on the border of Libya right now um, in Thailand and in Nicaragua, so they're in far less nice uh, places than us right now. But uh, And thanks to you for giving us the space technologies that we use every day. We've been to, in the last decade, 60 countries that have been struck by wars or natural disasters using your equipment. Um, uh, set up emergency telecom centers for hundreds of UN agencies, uh, uh, stricken governments and NGOs, and have served hundreds of thousands of people with free phone calls to after a disaster, 
reconnect them with their families, let them know who's alive and who's dead. And you, you really understand the power of, of uh, satellite communications when you allow somebody to make that call. So thanks to all of you. Thanks to our supporters who are here, including, I think, Vodafone, uh, AT&T, and Inmarsat are all here. So thank you very much. The Douglas Morrow Award is presented every year in honor and memory of the late Douglas S. Morrow, who was an Academy Award winning producer and director, uh, who was an early me uh, board member of the Space Foundation. And it recognizes the work of people who have done extraordinary things to bring the message of space and space achievement to the public. It has gone to entertainers like Tom Hanks. It has gone to astronauts like the crew of STS-95. Uh, it has gone to companies like IMAX Corporation and Life Magazine that have, uh, have uh, provided tremendous, tremendous coverage of uh, what it is that we do. And this year, uh, the award is presented to three extraordinary individuals who I had the pleasure of knowing for over 20 years who collectively have literally reached billions and billions of people with their reporting about our industry. Would you please uh, turn your attention to the video? The Douglas S. Morrow Public Outreach Award is presented to an individual, team, or organization that has made significant contributions to public awareness of and support for space programs. Douglas S. Morrow was an Academy Award winning writer and producer, space advocate, and early member of the Board of Directors of the Space Foundation. The 2011 recipients have been at the forefront of space news coverage via television, print publications, and online, and through their commentary have helped the nation understand complex scientific information, deal with national tragedy, and experience the triumph of discovery and accomplishment. NBC News correspondent Jay Barbary is the only journalist to have covered every manned U.S. space launch. A total of 163 Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, and Space Shuttle missions. Barbary joined NBC in 1958 as a part-time space program reporter based at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. He has spent his entire career in Florida covering space. From the Apollo 11 moon landings through the Challenger and Columbia accidents, Barbary has been at the forefront of breaking space news. Aerospace writer Marsha Dunn has covered the space beat for the Associated Press since 1990. By the time the space shuttle program ends this year, she will have witnessed and written about 99 shuttle flights. Dunn has also reported on two launches from the Baikonur Cosmodrome in Kazakhstan. In 1995, she was among the first group of U.S. journalists allowed into the Cosmodrome for a manned Russian Soyuz launch. This award-winning journalist is featured in one of the Sally Ride Science series of career books for youngsters, Cool Careers in Space Sciences. CBS News space consultant William Harwood has covered America's space program full-time for more than 27 years focusing on space shuttle operations, planetary exploration, and astronomy. Based at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida, Harwood provides up-to-the-minute space reports for CBS News and regularly contributes to CNET, Spaceflight Now, and the New York Times. A prolific blogger, Harwood writes, edits, and maintains CBS News Space, which provides detailed information about space exploration, statistics, demographic data, and coverage of planetary exploration across the solar system. Collectively, our 2011 Douglas S. Morrow Award winners have reached billions and are the deans of the space journalism community, Jay Barbary, Marsha Dunn, and Bill Harwood. time, I'd like to ask Jay Barbary to please join us on stage. Jay?
Well, uh, thank you so okay. much, Elliot. Yeah. Where's, where's Harwood? It's, it's embarrassing, Elliot. Um, we did all we could to uh, raise the veil, but it was just a little too much. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, it's said that I've covered every mission by American astronauts for the last 50 years. That's true, and I think I'm very fortunate that I haven't been sick during that time. And a big part of that is this wonderful woman over here named Jo that I've been married to for 50 years. She is the real partner. But the question, the question I'm also asked most often is about all of the flights, who was your favorite or most admired astronaut? Now, we've had some outstanding astronauts in the shuttle project. We got Eileen Collins, the first woman commander. She's my buddy. She's terrific. And then there's the happy commander, Charlie Precourt. He, you know, we've just got hundreds that we can name almost of them. And we go back to, uh, to uh, the moonwalkers and Apollo, Neil Armstrong. But if I have to pick one, it's got to be Alan Shepard, who's been mentioned here tonight. Now, the reason is very simple. When Alan made his first flight, it was after Yuri Gagarin was launched into space, which will be right now in four hours and five minutes, the 50th anniversary of his launch. He went second. The naysayers were out. They were saying, there's no need for us to go. Kennedy kept him going and he was launched. He had the entire weight of the American space program on his shoulders, one we would not have been here tonight if that had been a failure. Then a decade later, when he got his chance to go again, he got the Apollo 14. Fate stepped in again. There was Apollo 13, 205,000 miles from Earth. They lost their service module. The greatest successful failure in history, they got it back. Now, the naysayers were out and were saying, OK, let's cancel it. We've landed twice on the moon. We don't need to go again. So Alan Shepard, when he went to the moon on Apollo 14, had on his back again the entire space program. And he saved it each time. There was no turning back for Alan Shepard. He decided to write a book the only book that he wrote. And when he came to me, and he invited me to join him on that book, I was very proud of everybody and all the flights that we had, but I was more, never more prouder in my life than to be on the book with Alan Shepard. It was called Moonshot. We introduced it with Katie Kirk on the Today Show on May 28, 1994. It went on to be a New York Times bestseller. It was published in eight countries, including Russia and Japan. It was a four-hour TV drama, and it continued to sell as a bestseller book. As mentioned here tonight is Laura, Alan's daughter. She and I talked a couple of months back, as did Deke Slayton's son, Kent, and we decided to bring Moonshot back. So his anniversary, 50th anniversary, is coming up May 5th. And we're going to reintroduce Moonshot on that anniversary. It's going to be an e-book, electronic book with video of everything, and also the books again. So it's been a full circle of a half century. And we're back here tonight. And thank you so much for coming. And thank you again, Elliot. For the Bill Harwood is actually not in jail, but he is out doing what he always loves to do, which is covering a space story. He's had the opportunity come up at the last minute to fly on a SOFIA mission with NASA. And so we thank Jay for uh, using Bill's time here tonight. And at this time, I'd like to invite my good friend Marsha Dunn to the stage.
This is amazing. I am extraordinarily honored to be standing before you all tonight. When I first took over the aerospace, the aerospace beat for the Associated Press in 1990, I replaced a legend, Howard Benedict, who was retiring. It's been an incredible ride ever since. I've covered nearly 100 shuttle launches, and I thought I'd list a few of the ones that stand out most in my mind over 20 years. The Hubble missions, Endeavour's first flight in the three-man Inelset grab, the Italian tethered satellite missions, the flights to Russia's Mir space station. The Russians always provided us with plenty of drama to write about. <laughs> the John Glenn flight, the return to flight after the Columbia tragedy, the International Space Station construction missions, and now the final flights of Discovery, Endeavour, and Atlantis. I want to thank the Space Foundation for honoring me with the Public Outreach Award. And I'd also like to thank the two main men in my life who have been, who've had to share me as I work to bring the space story to all of you and to the entire world. My husband, Stefano Coladan, who is here tonight, and our young son, Nicholas, who dreams of becoming an astronaut and of one day flying to Mars. I love you both. Thank you all very much. Ladies and gentlemen, how about a round of applause for all of our award winners tonight? Uh, as you know, uh, this is an event that takes a lot of help to put on, and we are very, very blessed to have corporate members who are generous with their time and their resources, with their people, with their exhibits, with their hardware, and that allows us to do the kind of job that we do. Uh, the gen gentleman who's going to speak to you tonight uh, certainly falls uh, very, very squarely in that category. Uh, in fact, not only is his company a strong supporter and is he a strong supporter, but he actually serves on our board of directors as well. Would you please welcome from Northrop Grumman, Mr. Gary Irvin. Thank you, Elliot, and by the way, thank you very much for all the great work you do with the National Space uh, Foundation and also with the uh, National Space Symposium every year. You do a great job, and I know it takes a lot of work. And this one is a little special because this is the first one where Elliot has had his mother in attendance. So welcome. It's great to see you here. So good evening and welcome to tonight's opening ceremony. Competing against cocktails, good food, and fireworks is no easy task, so I'll keep my remarks brief. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the sacrifices of our brave servicemen and women engaged in conflict overseas. Their efforts are enabled by space-based assets that are second to none. Today's America is still the world's premier space power. It is imperative that we maintain that position while managing the positive and negative aspects as others around the globe try and catch up. Over the next few days, we'll be hearing distinguished speakers outline how intelligence, civil, military space communities are dealing with similar problems. I'm not here to downplay the formidable challenges we face, budgetary, political, and technical, but we've been here before. Budgets go up and down, economies expand and contract. There are peaks and valleys of procurement and innovation, but the space industry's ultimate course has been one of growth and technological advancement. The past decades have seen major advances in commercial space, protected military satellite communications, missile warning, Earth observation, and space science missions. It only took 50 years to go from a single, simple Sputnik to some 22,000 man-made objects orbiting the Earth, carrying out a wide range of missions. 
We built machines that visited many of the planets and moons of our solar system. The information provided by these machines has been invaluable in the engineering challenges and triumphs considerable. We know technology-driven schedule and cost efficiencies haven't fully impacted our industry as much as they have done in others. And obviously, a satellite can't be developed and delivered with the ease of an iPad when it must be certified to operate in the hostile environment of space. But for many, space remains too expensive and too slow. So we must do better, and I'm confident change will come. That's because the next generation will shape the industry to reflect the world that they have come to grow up in, one where technology enables faster, more efficient, and more, to, more affordable systems across the board. All of us in this room have an obligation to build organizations where this next generation can thrive and drive that change. They're telling us with their career choices that they won't stand for the status quo. We ignore them at our peril. I'm both an optimist and a realist. Yes, there will be less money for programs tomorrow than there was in the past. Yes, space is more congested, contested, and competitive. These conditions won't make our jobs any easier. But they will focus our minds and force us to affect positive change we may have resisted in easier times. I'll conclude by noting that tomorrow we commemorate the 30th anniversary of the first flight of the space shuttle. This year, we will commemorate that final flight. The space shuttle program required courage and engineering brilliance comparable to all those that preceded. Tonight, I'd like to recognize the engineers, the technicians, the scientists, and every other professional that took the space shuttle from blueprint to blue sky and onto space. Programs start, evolve, and end, but people are the constant. They will ensure our future endeavors are successful, inspirational, and worthy of the proud legacy of the past decades. Thank you very much. Space is a place that defies easy answers. We must assure missions that meet urgent needs and those that inspire and expand our knowledge of the universe. A generation that accomplished great things must ensure the next generation is set up for success. We need to balance affordability while maintaining future investment. Space has become more congested, more contested, more competitive, more interconnected. These are the challenges we face. These are the challenges we embrace. I just have like a deep passion for space. I just always have been interested in just understanding the deepest like fundamental laws of the universe and being able to actually work in that environment would just be the coolest thing for me. Once you can go out and get this order of magnitude or a better uh, reduction in cost and improvement in safety, everything in space uh, blossoms and becomes more affordable and more meaningful and, and your capabilities will, will just skyrocket. There are ways of doing this that are cheaper than what we have established right now. All you need is a breakthrough. It's on the shoulders of great achievement that we go forward. Our brief journey into the stars has yielded unimagined wonder and constant reliance. Soldiers, citizens, countless missions, endless opportunities, even trust between nations. Depends on space. It is how we come together to watch and listen to dream and discover, to empathize and energize, while the reins of research have tightened. The threats are pervasive. Cyber, physical, environmental, budget. From design to sustainment, resilience is required. For dreams remain.
questions linger. Minds contemplate. We have been here before. We will find a way. As we harness the power of light on earth, so we will tame the deepest darkness surrounding it, where we can collect more than ever, secure anyone, anywhere, guide a new kind of soldier home, and provide vision like never before. Remembering all the while that like freedom, assuring space missions isn't free. It requires our brightest, most innovative, most cost-efficient efforts. An algorithm. A mistake. A forgotten path. Audacity. Or just a simple bit of hope. No one knows which idea it will be, which spark will ignite the darkness ahead. But we do know it will come from you. From us. Together. At the place it all began. At the place it will all end. In space. Welcome to the 2011 National Space Symposium.